What's up? We're in the next part. Please go check out the previous part to gauge your bearings. I'm busy talking at present about <laughs> the defeatism of witches and how it is that they get themselves to a point where they receive little to no mercy on earth anymore. And where it is that they end up having nowhere to run but to God. And seeing as what it is that they have done all throughout their lives it is the very undermining of the God of the universe. It then comes, becomes very hard for them to try and love God without help from Christians. They are so menacing and they wreak havoc in the lives of so many people that ultimately when, village, when the whole village, when the whole community finds out that these people have done this thing and not only finding out but also have experienced a severity of tragedy due to the uh, in involvement of sorcery by the sorcerer. When they get there, people want nothing to do with them. They tend to have afflicted the body of Christ so much that we also want nothing to do with them. And now they have to be like they basically like beleaguered, cornered, like a rat in a corner. They are cornered. Like they get themselves to a point where they get cornered. Do you know what I'm saying? Like they have nowhere to look because everyone hates them, including Christians. I spoke in my previous part about how it is that they tax our reserves for magnanimity, magnanimity. They tax the Christian reserve for love. They underestimate the veracity of our humanity in that at the end of the day, while we are better than the human race, the rest of the human race, in our ability to walk as God would have us walk, we are still at the end of the day, half human. I spoke about how we're half human. We're actually just fully human, but you get my point. We, we are still human. We still have to make war with this body of death according to Romans 7. And they underestimate the veracity of that humanity. And how it is that sometimes Christians can also be petty at the expense of their relationship with God. But nonetheless, that's how they are. The Lord, upon rescuing us from the flames, saving us, making us his disciples, never ever guaranteed or promised any of us perfection prior to the incorruptible body. Prior to us ultimately inheriting eternal life, going into heaven and being unable to sin anymore. The Lord never ever guaranteed that our redemption would make us perfectly holy. All he said was that there is a holiness without which no one will see God. Some kind of a, a, a layer, a level that we all have to strive towards. Unless you have got faith like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You cannot walk with the faith like the Pharisees and expect to enter the kingdom of heaven. What is the faith of a child like? What, 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 what does childlike faith look like? What, 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 are, what are children like? Children are mendy, they're bendy, they're teachable. Children are pacifiable. Children easily forget. They are quickly snuffed out. They're fire whenever they're angry. You can quickly just snuff it out. You can pacify them very quickly by giving them a sweetie or just saying, sorry, Johnny. That's how kids are. Top of that, they're very teachable. They don't hold on to grudges. But we know children. They're sinners. We know children. They can annoy you. We know children. They're disobedient. We know children. They take cookies from the cookie jar. We know children. They do exactly the opposite of what it is that they, you tell them to do. And when you bust them, they cry. So they have a contrite spirit, a broken they, they, they're, they're, they're easily contrite. They feel guilty for disobeying parents and they cry quickly and they don't lie very well. They have got sinful qualities as the rest of us do, but they're far better able to conquer them. So we are not dealing with perfect souls here. We call children innocent in the world, not because they're truly innocent, but because they're far more innocent than the rest of us. So Christians are like children. We too are contrite largely. We are full of repentance. When we sin and our dad catches us, we cry. We mourn at his throne. We are pacifiable. It is easier for us to forgive. And we forget a lot faster too. But we sin like children and we disobey God every so often. We run with what it is that we want to run with. If you also think about children, how it is that they relate with each other. They can fight and scratch each other's eyeballs out. But if a parent intervenes, they are made to make peace. They are made to reconcile. They are made to love each other and hug. And because they value your opinion about their behavior, in so far as you are actively watching them in the room, they will then also give half of their sandwich to their brother to show that mommy, see, I'm a good girl because I'm sharing my bread with John. That's kids. They care about the opinion of their parent. But when the parent is absent, when the parent is out of the room, they then fight with John again and they take the sandwich back again. When the mom comes, they are contrite. They're sorrowful for basically their insincere disposition and how it is that they treated John. So essentially, our understanding of being surveilled by God makes us like children. We are suck-ups to God. We want him to view us in good light. 
We want him to reward us for being better. And so we love our brothers better due to the fact that we understand it's what pleases God. We also are genuinely motivated and our behavior therefore positively reinforced to truly love our brothers because there comes reward with walking in Christ. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But when we feel like God is not looking or when we are capitulating to the flesh, every so often we grab the bread of John. Every so often we fight John again. We scratch John again. Every so often we enter into a bicker and a fight. But it is the memory of a surveilling God that ultimately recovers us. That's how children are. So would you agree that it is entirely irresponsible to put constant repeat offense in the climate of a child and expect that child to maintain their childlike disposition? Grab a kid. Grab a kid. And then put them in an abusive environment. Take an innocent seven-year-old girl. Innocent of which, of course, is relative because she's not truly pure. She's still disobedient. However, teachable, malleable, all that stuff that I've just highlighted right now. Grab that seven-year-old girl, girl and then kidnap her. Put her in a four-by-four four cell. Feed her meager portions of bread and water. And then rape her every single day. And then see if at all that child is going to be maintained in her childlike innocence. See if that child is still going to have that magnanimous spirit, that easily contrite, uh, mendy, bendy disposition. Uh, see if that child is still going to care, basically, what a, a, the figure of authority in question thinks. Like, see if a, a, a kidnapped, sexually trafficked seven-year-old girl is still going to be wondering, what is my mom thinking about how it is that I'm treating this other, like, this, this particular man that's busy raping me every day if my mom wants me to be kind to everybody well at this point where is my mom because i've been kidnapped so the kid then basically wears a, a personality that deals with the situation at hand i am being raped i'm kidnapped they withdraw they're no longer as sweet as they used to be no longer as loving no longer care to actually please anybody now they're on overdrive self-defense mode they're self-protective now they're on God mode. And so now you have basically stripped a portion of the child's innocence away. You have made this child like an adult now. You have tended this child towards being like an adult who it's a lot harder to reach with an apology. They hold grudges. They're gaslighting. They're full of reverse psychology. It's, you, you can never really understand what they're thinking. They, they are unteachable. They're, they're obstinate. They're stubborn. Yeah, you, you, you make a child more like a sinner that is grown, a fully grown person. And this is what God has to say about all such activity in the scriptures. If anybody causes the, these little ones of mine to sin, it'll be better if a millstone were tied around their neck and for them to be thrown into the ocean than for them to face God in the judgment. So if at all Christians are like children and God says that if you make children sin, it's better for you to endure that judgment than to face him. Essentially what it means, it, what, it, what that implies is that when you grab a Christian and the only time that we can actually truly be born again is if we're like children. You are like one who's taking a child. And if you grab this Christian and you make them disregard what God thinks, you make them out of ease sin. You make them lose a sense of surveillance from God because of how much you've put them under so much attrition. You're boiling them. You're burning them. You're killing them. You're suffocating them. When then this kid inclines towards sin as a result of their torture, it'll be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and for you to be thrown into the ocean than for you to face God in the judgment because you have made a child of God sin. You have taken a believer and made them think that God is a negotiable on his precepts concerning not repaying evil for evil, turning the other cheek, not hating your enemies, blessing them, not cursing them, heaping coals of shame with kindness on their heads. When we are put under so much pressure, so much persecution, so much attrition that we are made to sin against basic biblical truth because we think that God gets it. He understands. He must understand because look at what I'm going through. When you've got profanity on your tongue, despite the fact that God said, let your speech be seasoned with salt. Let no, nothing evil even be spoken among you. The, the Bible is clear as to how in the world we ought to deal with profanity. And yet when you think that you can just throw the F word expletive, with, which I have done in this season of suffering, where you, you can be so mad, so angry that you can just throw the F word expletive at somebody who is wreaking havoc in your life. And then think that God gets where I'm like proper. He sees that I'm under too much pressure. He sees that I'm suffering too much. No, 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 no. God does see indeed. And indeed it is written in his word that he has compassion on us because he knows that we are made of dust. But understand that his compassion on our dust nature is not the equivalent of him being, co him conceding concerning his law. 
He still expects that I should not have used the F word. He still expects that I should not have in my anger gone to bed in all that wrath and ignored that he said in your anger, do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Do not commit murder with the um, heart. Do not, you get my point. He still expects that we honor his law. But when a Christian is walking in a season of less um, intentional obedience to God's word, because they are under so much pressure, they are suffering a lot. I mean, God is never going to let us be plucked out of his hands. So we're not facing hellfire for that. Even when we are low-key unforgiving of a particular circumstance, we are facing our ever losses, punishment. But what's more imperative to understand is that those who are facing an even more excruciating sorrow are the ones who put us in a position to suffer like this, uh, that we might ultimately sin against God. It's written in his word that offenses are going to come. God said that offenses are going to come, but woe to the men through whom offenses come. So basically people are going to sin. But woe to the person through whom those sins come to the earth. And which is, you put people under so much rubbish that they end up sinning when they would much rather have not wanted to, right? People who are driven to the occult because their lives are so blocked. They are offending God. But woe to you who put them in a position to go to a Sangoma because they're struggling to get a job. And worse off are you when you then cause a Christian, a child, one of these little ones of mine, it's written in God's word, to sin. When you grab a Christian, and then you greet them and greet them and greet them like a tomorrow until they think that God is okay with the fact that they're so mad that they can't even see the prospect of actually longing for the repentance of a witch. When you get a Christian to that mindset, you have gotten them to a place where they're not re transforming their minds. They're not being renewed. They are not trans re getting their minds renewed, transforming them by the be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the word of God. They're not abiding in him and his word abiding in them that what they ask for in prayer might then be awarded them. They're not walking in biblical Christianity. They're being dishonest with themselves and with God, thinking that he is mocked. They are seasonally in a trance induced by persecution. And this trance, God remembers that we are made of dust and so he has compassion on us. However, he has got a massive bone to pick with the fact that you made a Christian lose the rewards in heaven. Christian lose their cool. Christian, therefore, mess with their witness, mess with their testimony, because we are ambassadors of God on the earth. And when we misrepresent him, we essentially defile his name. And so when you mess with that, you mess with God. We overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So when we are walking in an unbiblical Christianity and we are out to justifying our works because we think that God is cool with this for a season, because God tends to bounce us back, okay? To sobriety again. You are the one that has caused the Christian to get to that point. We are like children. We are not perfect. But we are far better than the rest of the human race. We have the innocence that most of the human race does not have. But when you take us and you incarcerate us and feed us meager portions of bread and water and then rape us for seven years straight, taking away our innocence, on that day you cannot expect that child to be maintained in that childlike, cute, adorable, mendy, bendy, malleable state they were in. If at all the Lord compares true disciples to children, then you must understand that he understands that when you take a child and you abuse them for years, they're not going to be like a child anymore. So the Lord has mercy on the fact that every so often Christians are unchristian-like in the climate of an excruciating amount of persecution. We are only human. And that is something you incredibly underestimate the veracity of. Because sometimes you feel as if though you can always just run to the magnanimous Christian when the villagers are pursuing you. But sometimes we door slam you. And when that door is slammed, oh how unfortunate it is you are on that day. You know why? Because the very thing that made you trust the devil is the very thing that makes it very hard for you to then be a, a very mature seeker of God just by your own savvy. Just by your own lonesome. When the whole world has basically door slammed you, because they can't stand you. And when certain other members of the world are actually trying to pursue you to death, they're trying to kill you because you're a menace, a terrorist in society. All you have is God, not even Christians. I am trying to discourage witches from partaking in their craft. And I'm trying to get them to respect when people find out that they've done witchcraft to just stop at least. Because then if you stop, you might have attitude from that person that found out what you did, but you won't have them murderously trying to finish you off. It is the fact that you keep on going back to the drawing board and insisting and over and over and over and over and over again, afflicting them, gaslighting them, and then they endure so much loss as a result of your insensitivity and your ridiculous terrorism in their lives that they now basically border on being unforgiving. 
when people are there that's when you now all of a sudden want to run to the church because they are very happy to embrace you but which is you make it a whole career to pursue christians like you not only are a little beastly terrorist a genocidal freak making like hitler and pol pot in these streets against regular jays and joes you tend to make it your main prerogative to target christians so by the time you are exasperated from being a fugitive from an angry mob of villagers you tend to not even have christians to run to because you've made out of yourself a menace even in their ecosystem and when then you can't run to believers where will you go you don't trust satan anymore cuz look at how he's basically laying you destitute you're naked in the street having been busted for sorcery you have nowhere to go you have to then trust god by yourself there's actually a documentary it's just so sad there's a documentary i watched on youtube i think it's still there it likely might even be sitting on millions of views today cuz when i watched it it was newly uploaded and it was growing very feverishly the name of it i i, I would imagine it was growing feverishly because there's such a thirst in africa for such stories as these it was covered by a secular channel but there was a lot of spiritual activity going on on the inside the name of the documentary was called is called you can go google it witchcraft boloi it was called witchcraft boloi boloi spelled b o l o i witchcraft boloi with a uh, a forward um what do they call that a forward hash a forward whatever a forward strike a forward slash that thing yeah mm. in between witchcraft and boloi it's on youtube it was about this young man who got busted doing sorcery against his community in the wee hours of the morning in some bathroom where he yes he was just busted and the whole story was covered on the daily sun after getting caught the whole community was up in arms about how it is that this person is a terrorist against all of us it was there because it caught the daily sun the news he was then documented essentially um trying to recover this man this young man that was busted doing all of this stuff then made a decision that this stuff here is not worth it it's not worth it because look now everybody hates me all he had were the people covering the documentary but then he was left in the community where he was staying to basically be persecuted he ran to a church but it was not the church he went to the zcc church zcc mixes christianity with witchcraft with ancestral worship and all that jazz that man could not find help and he tried to find help he f- he tried to basically turn to god by himself the community wanted nothing to do with him he did not go to the true body of christ the zcc church only um, massacred him even more because they were just practicing themselves his coven didn't want him because he was exposing them on a documentary he was stranded having to seek god by himself as a demon possessed man that was in dire need of an excruciating amount of deliverance He ended up dying. He was killed. I believe he was killed by death spells committed by the coven, the witches in the community that he was exposing. They basically I imagine gathered against him and cast so many spells on him that he eventually ended up passing away. It was very sad to learn that the man who the documentary of which that I was watching had passed away. Nobody was giving him the right advice. I told you it was a secular channel. that was covering this but it was a story that was you know interesting so they decided to cover it it wasn't a christian channel so they did not help him they did not raise him up in the admonition of the lord they did not lead him to christians what i'm trying to explain to you guys is that when you are involved in darkness and then you suddenly get busted one night by angry villagers they will want nothing to do with you you will struggle to find true help because you will, the reason why you will have turned to the devil is cuz you don't trust god And so you won't know when you are walking into a false church you won't know that you are not supposed to be mixing Christianity with ancestral worship. You will not know the scriptures you will struggle to study by yourself. You will not know that this here is not the kind of environment I'm supposed to be in if I'm going to grow up in the admonition of the Lord you won't know the difference. And since there will be nobody who will want you in the community you're also going to suffer a severity of depression. You will then have a whole bunch of demonic attack coming at you from the occult that you are breaking away from and the only reason why you're breaking away from them is cuz like I said angry villagers you got busted you would not have stopped doing witchcraft if you didn't get busted by the whole village. So now you want to stop cuz you don't want to be hated. Now you want to stop. But you see your solution is in Christ. He is the way the truth and the life and no one comes to the father but through him. But when you're that severely demon possessed the devil has this thing that he does he sings the song to people you ain't going nowhere you ain't going nowhere people who are that severely involved in darkness 
when they try to give their lives to Jesus without a, a thriving community of believers to help them along in deliverance, they struggle. They get dragged back. They get dragged back. They get dragged back into the darkness. So they get tormented demons. Like whatever it is that they were dabbling with, whatever they were involved with, will always just be pouncing on their door either trying to block salvation and if they are i don't look i don't i don't even believe that christians can have demons so i i imagine that what happens at this particular juncture is that there is a severity of frustration that this person feels at wanting a relationship with god but they have burned so many bridges they have burned so many bridges with the body of christ that they don't even know where to turn it's easier to just get saved just because somebody gave you the gospel on the side of the street one day and you were like huh let me interrogate this while your life is still thriving you're still going to work every day you still have friends you're greeting hi bye you still have a normal life but when you are in a rush to get rescued from an angry mob pursuing you when you are in a rush to get rescued from christians that want nothing to do with you that have door slammed you when you put yourself in a position to basically be in flight it's going to be so rough for you to truly have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ that's going to snatch you from the flames. Largely because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the very reason why you were doing sorcery in the first place is because you did not believe God. So now that you have to self-study in order to find God out, it's going to be a near on impossible feat. It's not impossible for what's impossible, what's, what's hard or impossible for man is possible with God. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No, absolutely not. God can rescue a person just by himself. Having come from a severity of occult involvement, much like Saul on the road to Damascus, he can do that with a supernatural encounter. But sometimes he just doesn't. Sometimes he just doesn't. You've been such a menace to the body of Christ that now that you're at the end of yourself and the only reason why you now want to run to the church is because you got busted for witchcraft, God will just leave you. You were reprobate the whole entire time you were wreaking so much havoc in his church that that is your judgment. That is your judgment to just run around in circles, run around in circles. And God does say, if anybody cries out to me, they will, he will likewise not turn away. But you see, that's the thing. You struggle to cry out to him because you never trusted him in the first place. That's why you trusted sorcery. Try and find out who Jesus is when you come from that depth of darkness with no Christians helping you along. It's going to be a near and impossible feat. You put yourselves in a squeezed little sandwiched, sandwiched, sandwiched position where it is that you're going to struggle to break out of the sliver. You're going to struggle because you need Christians in order for you to get delivered from that level of occult involvement. You can't do it on your own. You can't self-deliver, not when you come from that level. Self-deliverance is for the random cheeky and dude that got born again having generational curses that go back 10,000 years. That go back to the grand, great, 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 great. Okay, so we have not been on earth for 10,000 years. That was a hyperbole, but you get my point. Like self-deliverance is for people like me who uh, never da dabbled came to christ and as soon as you got born again you started to see the lord's face to conquer generational curses and all different kinds of weird stuff it's for people like me self-deliverance is not for people who have been high priest and high priestesses involved in sorcery for twenty thousand years you can't self-deliver when you've been that deeply involved in the occult you need help you need the body of christ and you occult practitioners put yourself in a position to be hated by the body of christ you put yourself in a position, like when you persecute the church, they run from you. They want nothing to do with you. And sometimes you have afflicted them so badly and stolen so much from them. You have ripped carpets from underneath their feet so much that all they see is the person that killed their mom when they look at you. All they see is the person that stole 10 years of their career when they look at you. All they see is the person that blocked their womb and made sure they can't have children when they look at you. All they see is the person that basically made their lives a living nightmare. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. And this earth is fleeting. We are not to take anything with it. We must gather for ourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not come in and steal. But it's, it takes a lot of our spiritual maturity for us to think like that 24 hours a day. At the end of the day, earthly acquisitions, when we lose them, they sting too with Christians, albeit us being sojourning to a heavenly city, a heavenly country. This is not our home. So we should not be latching onto anything here. But remember, we are made of dust and we are human and we live this earth. We are filling the earth and we are occupying it. We buy homes here too. We buy cars here too. We fe we form fellowships here too. We marry men and women here too. We bear children here too. We live on this earth and so that which we acquire here too also has meaning and value to us. Therefore, when we lose it, just like the world, we cry. Maybe not as much as the world cries, but we still feel a sense of loss. And when the person 
that is standing in front of you. You are responsible for taking away houses, fields, mothers, brothers, sisters, cousins, like everything for you are the person that took away from them all that stuff written about in Mark 10. While the Lord might have guaranteed you that you're going to gain a hundredfold over all those things that you lost with persecutions and in the next life, eternal life, bottom line is in the run up to you getting all that stuff back. All you see is a person that took your husband. All you see is the person that murdered your husband, that, 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 that made you a widow, a, a widow. All you see is a person that caused you seven miscarriages and for some strange reason you could not conceive so you ended up adopting. All you see is the random buffoon that made your life a living nightmare and on top of that despite the fact that you kept on dreaming about what under heaven they were doing and telling them I know what you're doing to me they still carried on there's a woman that contacted me on 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 um on in, in my is it my, my she sent me an email but she also wrote me on my blog she was crying that her husband was busy with her with black magic guys you know for me it was like obviously if this woman is aware that her man is busy with her with black magic she must have raised it with him she must have been like please stop doing this stuff to me she was a miserable wife dealing with a great deal of uh, in, like torment to a point where her children were worried about her this is not a woman that is just sitting holding her you know horses she's not holding her peace she's likely raising it Jabu, please me and i'm begging you stop afflicting me i love you I'm, I'm not going i'll stay and this man just keeps on going back so drawing board drawing board drawing board i mean really and truly when this jabu now is being pursued by the whole village trying to chop his head off decapitate him for his occult involvement and the wife is now also in that mob angry he is going to want to basically tap into the fact that but i'm your husband he is going to want to utilize the reality of the fact that this woman at some point shared a bed with him but once she's gotten to a height of irritation and sorrow and brokenness because now this man has not only endured her through all that sorcery but he sacrificed one of their daughters she's just going to look at a mob put a, a, a tire pour around his waist pour petrol on it and burn him she is just going to watch her husband get killed because he had it coming and as he is dying or as he is being mobbed as he is being you know co uh, uh, castigated by an angry mob of people he will look into his wife's eyes with that whole look of please do something i'm your husband but when you have gotten a person to a point of that level of indignation you can not for the life of you what's the word that i am uh looking for you 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 cannot try to use their former relationship you you can't ugh, it's it's eluding me when there's the status quo you can't appeal to the, the the sense of your wife's wifehood anymore because she has divorced herself from that reality just by mere virtue of being exquisitely wrathful too that 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 is exactly what becomes the end result of witches when then you cannot go to people that should care a lot more about you because you've afflicted them you will have to go to god but it becomes so near and impossible to go to God because one you don't trust him that's why you're a devil worshiper and secondly you can't self-deliver for crying out loud when you've been involved in that level of, of occult involvement occult magic you can't self-deliver you need help and yet those that are in a position to help you you can't even appeal to them because they've door slammed you at their own peril at their own peril it is at their own peril I will admit that they're sinning against God they're sinning but like in that sinful state of theirs they temporarily feel entitled to it because of what you did to them you have your witches you put you like the more stubborn you are to repent despite feeling conviction to repent the more you make sure that when you are cornered like a rat you have nowhere to go and that's why so many people in the occult end up committing suicide that's why so many people in the occult end up getting murdered with them trying to leave the occult they end up getting murdered by if not an angry mob of villagers vigilantically but the occult the other occult members of the occult who are possessive of their members saying that you live here in a casket they end up passing away before they can even slip into the kingdom of heaven with the body of christ having door slammed them with the body of christ having door slammed them and remember the reason why we end up door slamming is because we loved on you this guy on this youtube channel spoke about how it is that you know this auntie i loved on her when she was struggling i was there for her a b c d e p q and z but then after years of enduring all of this random rubbish at the hands of these people it comes a time when you're like you know what whatever bugger off man bugger off bugger off i don't want anything to do with you bugger off we don't get to say to people bugger off when they want help but sometimes that's what we do and i'm trying to warn you witches that you cannot rely on the christian's christianity 
when you have endured them through so much rubbish that they want nothing to do with you anymore. They sometimes will completely ignore what Jesus would do. They will sometimes be so afflicted by you. Like a child that has been raped, molested for years. They will lose their innocence. And so therefore not appropriately respond like Christians are supposed to respond. We know what the Bible says. But sometimes we gather things in our own little image. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. There is a way that sometimes seems right to a man or a woman who has eternal life. But those deeds are dead. Because we are not perfect. We have dead deeds. That's why we have to keep on making war with this body of death. That's why it's even possible to grieve the Holy Spirit. If it wasn't possible to grieve the Holy Spirit, there would not have been a need to utter that in the scriptures as a whole issue in the kingdom of heaven. The Bible says that do not despise prophecies. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit by ignoring what Jesus would do. WWJD. We ignore that. And so the Holy Spirit gets grieved. Blurting out into tongues. In a whole public congregation grieves the Holy Spirit. But you do it anyway, Christians. You do it anyway. We are able to grieve the Holy Spirit precisely because that is a deed that is feasible to do. It's, it, it, it makes it clear that we are not perfectly able to worship God as we ought. But we do have a holiness with which we are ultimately going to see God. We are better than most. That's what I'm getting at. We are better than the planet, but we haven't arrived. And so if at all a Christian is in the process of grieving the Holy Spirit, you don't even have them to run to, okay? You don't have them to run to. They will have to face God for grieving the Holy Spirit one day at the Bema Seat. The Lord will deal with them. The Lord will probably deal with them even before they get to the Bema Seat. The Lord will cause them to repent later on. Realize after the act that, oh snap, no, I should have been there for that person. I feel bad now that they've passed away. They've committed suicide like proper. A Christian archer feeling guilty that a person that was obviously beleaguered on all sides. All that that Christian could think at the time. When now their day in court was arriving, their comeuppance was arriving, all the Christian would say, was saying at the time was, you had it coming. Why were you such a witch? Why did you kill my mom? Why did you take my career? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why did you mess with that woman's womb? Why, 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 why? There are four nieces in the family that have passed away because of you. Why, why, why? And then when that person is then found hanging on a noose in their apartment and the phone call comes in, so-and-so has passed away, then the Christian is like, ish son. Then they start to feel guilty. Then they start to feel sad. Then they start to feel some kind of way. Then they start to realize that they were not gracious. So God might even deal with that believer even before the bema seat. But you're already in hell now, aren't you? You're burning now. You've gone and committed suicide now, haven't you? You're, you're no brain. Like, it's, you're done for. And the Christian that you were abusing wanted nothing to do with you before you died. But now... She wishes she had been a little bit more lenient and perhaps allowed you to talk to her and perhaps, you know, introduced you to a couple of things, helped you understand what, what is required for you to come out from this darkness that you're in now that you're dead. Now, proper guys, you put yourself in a position to experience that. So really, if I can disincentivize some witches from witchcraft, let it be today. This stuff does not end well for you. You, you, you exsanguinate mercy out of your own marrow. You make sure that even the most magnanimous people on earth sin against God where you're concerned because you take away their innocence by putting them under a lot of pressure. You put them under a lot of sin, a lot of pain until they partially sin. I will use yet another um, example where it is that a Christian or a child of God, a believer, a biblical e example here, ended up almost sinning because he was just persecuted. He was afflicted by arrogance. And if it was not for somebody basically restraining his neuron genocide, he would have found himself with the severity of a guilty conscience on his head. David, in the story of Nabal and Abigail. Nabal, David, he had done favors for that particular country, for that particular man, that king. In the past, he thought he had a, a gentleman's agreement. He thought he had an alliance with that particular nation. And one day when he needed, when he needed food for his men and for his camels, Basically, he's like, what, what is this like? Um, he's, what, yeah, it was, it was a camels or horses or whatnot that they were traveling on. He then uh, sent to Nabal's town or city or village or whatever you want to call it on some help us out, please. We need water and food for our camels. We're coming through. Nabal responded, even though David had helped him in the past by saying, who that is? I don't know who that is. Please tell them to go away. David got so mad that he basically told his men that prepared to kill every man and basically every male in that town must just be massacred. Abigail overheard this, who was the wife of the king, Nabal. And she stood in the gap by basically uh, getting her maid servants, women in the streets, 
to cook and bake and do what they need to do get some water put stuff in some wine skins and do what it is that was supposed to be done by Nabal and then she stood in the gap for her whole town of men by saying please don't let this thing be on your conscience my husband Nabal is a foolish man hence his name's sake his name is fit for purpose but do not kill an entire village an entire town an entire city an entire country because of one foolish man and David was stayed. It's written in God's word that a gentle answer a, gen, a gentle answer turns away wrath. And Abigail stayed David's wrath. And so David, uh, David's conscience was also stayed from having committed that genocide. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if at all uh, Abigail was able to do that inside Nabal, not Nabal, sorry, inside David, it it shows that God can and indeed sometimes does intervene. In the heart of a christian but the fact that david was able to be spurred up in that attempted genocide says that when you treat us like trash after we've been good to you after we've done nothing but dote over you the the, the wording that that american man used was love on you he was like yeah, these people we we, uh, we loved on them we did everything for them and then they treated us like this he ended up saying in his video that how 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 do we how do i deal with them because it, it was alive so people that were commenting asking him questions one of them was like so how do you deal with these witches and this dude was like all that i ever asked god to do with these people is just judge them judge them one person in the comments said no repentance in the live and this guy's like no why would i want to waste my time asking for repentance because these people keep on going back to the drawing board over and over and over again you go to them you love on them you do all this and they just keep going back to the drawing board so now i just want judgment that's unbiblical it's unbiblical but i got where he was coming from because i also got there i also in, like literally walked in a grieving of the holy spirit that i could tell i'm grieving god i could tell i just wanted to kill him all i wanted them dead like david wanting all of nabal's men the whole town of men dead leaving nothing but uh, bereaved daughters and widows and the wisdom of abigail basically ceased that right from happening god is amazing in that he can bring that kind of intervention to prevent a christian from experiencing a severity of guilt when people die when people ultimately pass away but i know that the what david felt i can personally say i have experienced it in my heart where i have literally imagined that i would not care if all my friends from high school died in one sitting that i would not care if my cousin like god kept on giving me dreams and visions about her passing away in a car accident and i was like it has not happened fast enough the lord was telling me that she would pass away in a car accident if she doesn't repent you see like that caveat was always there if she does not repent beware repent or perish it was with the lord it was always repent or perish but in my heart it was just perish all i wanted was perish because i was exasperated i was i was I was afflicted, I was tortured, I was tormented perpetually by the same rubbish over and over and over again. And all I could say to God was, why is it taking so long? Why must I keep telling her to repent? I've been doing it for years. Let her dad mourn her. Let her sister mourn. Let her mom mourn. Since they all supported her anyway. Let everyone that can cry, cry. I also certainly am not going to be at the funeral. Yeah, that's me. Out here being like David. I loved on her. In the beginning, I sent her when I was still, you know, nicely loving before all this attrition slapped me sent her an email and said i know what you are doing girls okay what under the bridge i'm a christian stuff like this doesn't work on me and then she got to spitefully say <laughs> and stuff like this doesn't work on you look you lost everything and i'm the one that's kept you in a prison in a bunch and she would not stop despite me still suffering i'm still going through it i'm still yet to get what i need i am bereaved all day every day about my geriatric womb and the fact that ain't no man doting over me as his wife and she's still busy sorcery from here to timbuktu other like about a couple of months ago i had a dream where the way she so doesn't want me getting married i married her in that dream married her she was my husband oh guys that's like as in like just witchcraft from here to twenty thousand years from now everything that they can pull up their sleeves tricks they pull them out i mean that person you started out loving on them like that american guy's words verbatim we loved on them yeah and then they pull in nabal you helped nabal along you have an alliance with that country and then they conveniently forget what you did i mean yeah at some point you're going to commit genocide the sentiment of david is something that courses through the veins of christians we are human do you understand and every so often we feel as if though we will have no qualms neither bat any eyelids if the wicked just keep on getting dropped like dominoes da 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 the guy from america yo when that dude was speaking the american um brother from another mother all i could think about was 
the way that you feel. I, now that I'm listening to you from a vantage point way, I'm hearing myself speak through another human being. Your voice is like my voice just in a man. I see just how unbiblical you are. And so therefore I'm unbiblical. I'm critical more so of other people than I am, of course, of myself, right? That's just the nature of our selfishness as human beings. And my criticality of that man bounced right back to me like an echo because I realized that the way he feels about his aunt and his family members that are raw with sorcery is the way I feel about the guy in America. Like, unlike my family members who, of course, they're my family, so I don't want them to die, even though they've afflicted me. Even the ones in the extended space, except for my cousin, like, I can't stand her. I can't, like, yeah, I can't. Anyway, I'm just confessing what's, ha what's happening in my heart. This guy in America, I have wanted him dead for so long. So long. And sometimes God gives me, so there is this, there are these two stories in America that God keeps on bringing to the surface of my understanding. Every time I just want this guy literally eliminated from the face of the earth. One of them is of this one white chick that killed her boyfriend. They were always fighting, scratching their eyeballs out. And she got away with murder. She killed him and to this day she's still walking around free. He passed away. She was violent. She stabbed him because of a technicality and some loophole. She got away with it. And she keeps on uploading photos on her Instagram and everything. Her new life, new man, yeah, whatnot. She killed her boyfriend and she got away with it. And a story in the US, she was an, a social media influencer. Well-known story that did its rounds in the media. And like OJ Simpson, she's walking. <laughs> she killed her man. <laughs> the Lord, every time in my anger, I'd be like, this guy just needs to die. While he was busy with all of his sorcery. The Lord would flash vision that white chick on some, you are like her. You would get away with that murder. Because you're my daughter. You're not going to go to hell. You're not going to burn for eternity. Your unforgiveness and the rivalry that you feel. Like you're going to get some kind of judgment for it. But it won't be the permanent kind. You're going to get away with it. Like OJ Simpson, you're going to walk these streets despite killing your wife. Well, he was not my wife, my husband. I dated him briefly, right? Type thing he would be gone and i would like that chick instagram photos taking them out you living your life afresh when you contributed to the death of a man like a person died and went to hell and you contributed to it but you're gonna get away with it <laughs> i'm sorry and i find it funny <laughs> the lord basically has been warning me for months that the way you feel about this guy if he ended up dying with you having this kind of emotional sentiment about him, you would be like his killer that would walk like proper, just walk. I, I'm, <laughs> I don't like that guy. I'm sorry. I don't I, I really despise him. I do. I don't like him. But you see, I'm saved. <laughs> he has been the bane of my existence. And I have not been able to deal for years. And he has not been the only person all up in my grill. But he's been like still to this day. He's like a cockroach in my bed, on my hair, in my skin. He only, I am so livid because he was a stranger on top of that. That decided to afflict the person that he doesn't even know. He's ridiculous. Do you understand? And I don't know what it would take for that guy to repent. But it got to a point where I was like, I don't care. If he repents, if he, because I, I loved on him. Even after finding out he did witchcraft, I told him I was aware. I told him he needs deliverance. I told him he needs to walk away from darkness. I sent him emails giving him counsel as to what churches to join in California that he might find redemption from the thing that he's... Guys, I loved on that guy and then he just decided that he's going to mess with me. Go and spend a thousand dollars on a witch doctor in Jamaica. All the, uh, so I got to a point where I'm like, when is he going to die? And the Lord confirmed to me that he would eventually die from a suicide death. He's going to be driven to that if he doesn't repent with God. It always comes with Luke 13 vibes. But with me, it's half of Luke 13. God says repent or perish. I'm just like perish. I'm just like that. I'm so afflicted that I'm just like, let this guy just die. When is he going to die? I don't know when he is going to pass away. I'm just sharing what's going on in my heart. That's how severely abused I've been and tormented by this man I am. And because God, what would Jesus do? God is God. He's not a man that he should lie. He's not a man to change his mind. He's not mutable. He says, if anybody will repent, I will likewise not turn away. God is the one 
that awards grace, you know, long suffering, slow to anger, bonding instead steadfast love, or not willing that anybody should perish, all that should come to a knowledge of him. What would Jesus do? Jesus would give this man time. Jesus would basically keep calling this man to repentance. Jesus would try to love on him and dote on him, despite the fact that I'm not trying to do that anymore. I'm not trying to do that anymore. I know what Christ would have me do, but Romans 7, I'm making war with this body of death and temporarily I feel entitled to a person being exsanguinated from the earth and taken to hell because I'm tired. Why? Because he's incarcerated me. He's made out of me like that woman in the movie Room, buried a woman in his sorcery and his spells and is insisting on marrying her when she wants nothing to do with him. God has used that story in America. Like I, he has compared, he has basically compared me to that white chick that killed her boyfriend and today she's walking scot-free because of a loophole. All right in the court system he also compared um me to candace owens there was this one story of this one dude that she covered uh oh some dude that got killed in a what do you call this thing in, in a in a subway right a train there in america yeah and like some dude basically like choke holded him because uh, he was running amok and telling people that he is he, he's gonna kill them he's gonna do whatever and then ultimately they subdued him and he he ended up like he, a white man subdued him right and held him in a chokehold until he died so basically essentially this white man could have just let him go at some point seeing as so many people were helping him pin this man down but this man decided to finish this guy off he finished him off even though he could have easily just been held in a safe position until the police came and arrested him but he killed him and there was a whole rockers in the US by the black mob in America, the Black Lives Matter mob, on some, yeah, you see white people are always killing black people, blah, blah. And because Candace Owens, in her conservative view, is always just very strict concerning these things. And she, she basically just looked at him like he was a bit of a George Floyd, which it wasn't. I, I came to be concluded in my heart that this is not the same as George Floyd. That white man did take things too far. That was culpable homicide. He did kill that man. He did not have to. You could have just basically made him dizzy. And then like I was, like a whole, five men could have just held him down. Seeing as he also did not have a weapon on him uh, type thing. And then the police would have come and arrested him. And yeah, he did not have to die. I came to the conclusion that this time around, people were right to basically lament that that dude did not have to kill that man. But Candace Owens was like, I don't care. She was just she was just so incredibly careless to speak about this man on some, he had to go because why in the world in heaven was he busy flailing his little sword in the, or his little whatever was the thing that that guy was doing in that subway train thing. Yeah, and I remember just thinking, Candace, right now you're being insensitive because that this is not a George Floyd situation like at all. It's not similar. It's not that guy did not have to die and the white man who killed him frankly I think is responsible for culpable homicide whether or not it has to do with race is irrelevant what's important is that this here was a situation where a man did not have to die that's it and God compares this buffoon that um in the US me he compares me to Candace Owens and my sentiment about how it is that he was busy threatening to kill me so he gotta die even though at some point he got subdued at some point he got smothered at some point he got made like to just it was clear that he was no longer a threat at some point it was evident that he was no longer a threat and so you were just supposed to let him live and go to prison the guy in America is presently not a threat right now and never mind just right now but even somewhere a, a couple of months ago he stopped being a threat from what the lord showed me and yet i was still like he gotta go because he was still casting all these spells on me he was subdued and i wanted life to leave his breath his lungs like all together and god would flash vision me with that candace owens picture on some you was uh, your sentiment about candace owens this time around being harsh that's how i feel about you and i have been ignoring what god is saying his whole time first he compared me to the white chick that killed her boyfriend and got away with it and then he compared me to candace owens who was a little insensitive about the, some dead uh, like black man in a, in a subway train and then also he compared um that guy to darby in the movie what do you call this thing uh law abiding citizen darby is the dude that killed that man's wife and kids if you've seen the movie law abiding citizen essentially this is a man that takes matters into his own hands and then eventually ends up dying because he's busy trying to mess with the system that uh, did not give him justice for his wife's death god has been warning me over and over again that you it's an overkill with the guy in america it's an overkill and that's why i don't talk about him as much anymore I stopped talking about him because I realized that God does not consider him a threat anymore or something that is worthwhile to talk about even though he keeps on going back to the drawing board. 
Wang Bor, I am dealing, however, with a whole bunch of nonsense from this particular country. Men here, women here, miscreants here. I'm dealing with South Africans, a lot of them, uh, and complete strangers sometimes even on the internet. They're the ones that are worth my while to actually basically blow my top on the rooftops with all of their darkness and warn them, repent or perish, repent or perish type set setup thing. But because this guy in America was close and he was a lover to a certain extent, because he was basically and on top of that he was a stranger over and above being close i found him brazen to attempt to do this to me a stranger he does not know so i just imagined suga like an, a rodent on the side of the street squash it because i ain't gonna miss it but then the lord told me you know like with david you're mad you're angry but like this year is going to result in genocide oh this year is going to result in unnecessary bloodshed like the person doesn't have to die he's no longer a threat let him go to prison let him live a meager life for the rest of it. Let him just basically, you know, sit around in the streets of America, gathering dust, remembering a time when he messed with a woman that was not his. But he does not have to die. He does not have to die. And so I guess I've just gotten to a point now where I don't even talk that much anymore about that dude in the US, even though he read all that uh, loads of havoc all up in my grill type establishment thing. Overkill, essentially, is what God is showing me. But just the fact that I got that overkill, that's what I'm talking about right now. Like you afflict people who dote on you, who love on you, who try to offer you an olive branch until they start to walk like an Ephesian, kind of struggling with love and feeling like some people got to die because now I'm sick and tired of suffering. When you make a person suffer, when you put a person in such a squeezy tight position that they feel as if though they can't breathe anymore, they're being electrocuted 24 hours a day. You sometimes extract the grace that they are the graciousness that they ought to be walking in, given that they're Christian. So thank God we are not God because <laughs> so many of you would be dead if we were because our judgments would have come a lot sooner than yours would. Thank God that he's foreboding. Thank God that he's magnanimous in ways that we aren't. Thank God that he's the one that is the final authority and not so much us. Thank God that our anger is not the, the end basically of the wicked because we have got a short fuse in a way that God just doesn't. But I'm just trying to put this out there, wicked men and women. All of this involvement of yours in the occult. You are literally messing with the only people on earth that have enough magnanimity to ride you out in deliverance. But sometimes when you need help from them the most, that's when they want nothing to do with you. Because in the run-up to you needing that help, you are so insistent on finishing them off that they have not door slammed you at their own peril. God will judge them. God compared me to some white chick that got away with killing a boyfriend. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the Lord is not necessarily proud of me, but I will be dealt with later. However, very mildly, sort of like a wrist, a slap on the wrist in comparison to somebody dying and going to hell for eternity. That's all that your mockery achieves. You die and the Christian gets given a slap on the wrist for hating you at your death. Like proper, you are risking having somebody push you off a cliff because they're sick of you. And then God give them a slap on the wrist for that. Because at the end of the day, if you don't go to hellfire, you have got a slap on the wrist. Trust me, no matter what you what, what reward you lose in eternity, that is a slap on the wrist. And if somebody is truly born again, you are basically risking having them, given that they're given the strength of God, finish you off because they're tired of you. And then God slap them on the wrist. That you're, you're facing that. You're facing that. You frustrate us to a point where we no longer care if you live or die. And this guy that was telling his um, testimony, he lost his mom and you could tell that he was re he was really embittered about that. He was caught in a time of compromise and as a result of that, he wasn't able to stand in the gap for his family. I told you guys that uh, my, my cousin, uh, I, I have two cousins who have tried to sacrifice family members and they have failed because of the fact that I've been standing in the gap this whole time. And I've been able to successfully stand in the gap because my life has not been as severely compromised as that man's. But he wasn't able to stand in the gap for his own mom. And that has made him really mad. It's made him angry. And after now, you have killed a man's mother. Dude, a chances of recovering from that. All that that guy sees when he looks at his aunts are just these people that need to just go to hell already. He does not see the, the, the repent part of repent or perish. He just sees perish. All he prays to God for is the end of his enemies. You know how God gave solomon so much um grace he a favor wisdom because uh, because solomon asked for wisdom instead of the life of his enemies so god basically looks proudly on like a like a you know a, a proud dad he looks proudly on christians who seek out wisdom and magnanimity and love and honor and forgiveness and all these beautiful things that come with piety or above revenge he would much rather that we seek mercy over judgment 
because that's what he is that's who he is he's magnanimous he is slow to anger he would much rather we be like him he would much rather that we also choose mercy over judgment but it is so hard to choose mercy and to pray a prayer of mercy to god for those who keep on afflicting you when they're still in the heat of their affliction and occult practitioners laesha you force until the person prays nothing but god kill him kill him kill him kill him kill her kill her kill her kill her i'm tired of these wishes you get people to a point where they will come on youtube and counsel people to forget about mercy that's what that man probably said to his audience today or as at today that's when i watched it he did it five days ago he said i just pray for god to judge them fully and finally because i ain't got no time to be asking for repentance for people who i loved on i doted on and they just kept on going back to so the drawing board <laughs> like dude i you know what you remind me of me you're not being biblical right now but i feel you i see where you're coming from i get it i totally get it because witches you get people to that point you drive us up walls you shorten our fuses you mess with our temperance our gentleness which we ought walk in you put us in an ephesian church instead of a philadelphian one you mess with our walk and our safety before christ you you mess with uh, with the acceptability of our persons before god you make us walk in sin and when we walk in sin our prayers get hindered you mess with so much and for that the lord sometimes hands you over to a reprobate mind because it'll be better for a millstone to be tied around your neck and for you to be thrown into the ocean than for you to face god in the judgment because you caused a disciple of his to sin the lord will always consider it first prize for us to desire the repentance of our enemies no matter how prolific a witch a high priest a high priestess a satanic beastly dastardly monstrous mongrel rolling around in these streets spreading herself for himself like a green laurel tree we long indeed just like in that proverb that they should just disappear other day i spoke about how it is that i want them to go to the bermuda triangle and like ships and airplanes at that area just never come back again i feel strongly and this this strong sentiment mind you is awarded people i used to love very much friends family members but remember this is the rwandan genocide where family members feel like it's okay to kill other family members husbands killing wives because the wife is a tutti and he's a hooty men feeling entitled to women because insofar as you are not an ancestral worshiper and everybody has abandoned you because of all the witchcraft in africa operating in your particular life i'm gonna rape you i'm just gonna take you i'm gonna do what i want to do it's like that war in bosnia crime against humanity rape like no man's business well now i'm just at the end of myself and i want nothing to do with them to a point where if they died i'd be like oh goodness whoa you woke me up to tell me that <laughs> i'm yawning you get us there you desensitize us you take love out of the most loving people on earth not for everybody just for you so essentially which is what i'm trying to explain to you is that you're defeatist with all of your genocidal antics because at some point the village will turn against you and when the village turns you will want to go to christians and they too will door slam you you do best to repent right now when you're feeling uncomfortable with your trash. You do best to run to a church right now where they will still open their doors wide for you because the community has yet to reject you. Because you have yet to afflict that particular church so much that they will also now want nothing to do with you. Right now is the day of salvation, the acceptable day of the Lord. You must repent today or perish. Because tomorrow you might get busted doing witchcraft on a rooftop in a house naked villagers will want to kill you you will try to run to god and instead people will make out of you a spectacle being interviewed by some newspaper in the country and then you will shortly afterwards pass away do not say that we have not warned you you make people hate you which is i'm just saying you extract mercy even out of the merciful otherwise known as christians you are merciless so much that you cause even the merciful to not even gaze upon you for one second you put yourselves in a position to interrogate and peruse god by yourselves when you're demon possessed and the devil will have nothing to do with that seeing as he has held on to you fast you ain't going nowhere you can try to cry out to god but without christians having been that deeply involved in the occult you are not getting delivered girl you are not getting delivered just get saved today it's what i'm getting at i'm signing out in christ's name i hope you've been edified cran k peace